they better so better participate in what we're having because anyway put the effort you have you know missed your parties home it's missed going outside to sector 21 to eat food stuff uh, may as well mix good use of this uh, time that we're spending here so in the next of uh, hour hour and a half or two we're going to discuss a few things which are useful for us to make us as better researchers many of these are useful for us to become better engineers also so i'm going to start off with uh, better writing so <coughs> and in that i'm going to start off with email 101 so for the ug sitting here have you seen these uh, set of comics have you heard about phd comics uh, so you should seriously look at them if you are contemplating a career in research or what phd's are and there is also a very good movie called fact two parts <coughs> phd movie how many of us have seen the phd movie wow okay so you should go home and you know just to get a glimpse of what the phd life is so phd what does phd stand for doctor in philosophy doctor of philosophy there's another term for it so it's uh, it's, so it's permanent head damage that that is something it can do to you you know if you're not careful so one of the important things that you do during your phd is just write gazillions of emails and as of now become faculty recently i think uh, what we were writing in phd was nothing compared to what we have to do now uh, so it just keeps on increasing as you grow up the ladder and this is shown so this is a typical phd student who is you know really worried about ki what would my guide think about xyz i am doing and the guide sense okay done this is not good bad send me a better report things like that uh, why we talking about emails because uh, there is a deluge of emails that you end up writing especially more towards your in your research career so this is a tool by mit called immersion and this is showing uh, a connected graph of the different people i write a lot of emails to this is not me this is another guy by the same name so it effectively clusters them also very nicely so all of these are my teaching assistants in the course that i was a head ta for introduction to programming uh, any ideas on who this big uh, blue dot on the middle could be Yeah, my advisor, my PhD advisor. These other guys, uh, big blue dots, are the people who I was closely working with. Uh, these magenta color folks are some of the people who are uh, who minded some programs, who, who like who did some projects, projects with me. So, in about <coughs> one year or so, one point four years, there was an exchange of ten thousand emails. just to give a you know share volume it's a huge number 10000 and this is something like if you do it well you can create a very good impact if you do it bad 10000 times it's getting magnified uh so this as i said it's going to be very exercise driven a very hands on session so imagine that you know you want to for for btex you want to go to ms uh, at cmu at mit at harvard stanford uh for the mtech folks you want to oh, is there any phd guy here no okay so i missed the phd guys for some reason uh for mtech folks you want to go to you know again cmu mit harvard stanford for for a phd so write an email to your potential advisor let's say your potential advisor is a show of hands like who would your potential advisor be who is the coolest researcher you want to work with outside of iit gandhinagar show of hands please any names beta guys andrew ng i would love to work with him anyone else sorry ian good fellow okay anyone else yeah we need we're not proceeding further until you give me more names okay parameterized algorithms who do you want to work with Okay, Saket sort of. Yeah. Sorry. And what field is this? Okay. I see. I see. Yeah. Any other second year M Tech? 
computer vision yeah with whom with whom do you want to work okay only good fellow yeah okay okay so let's now assume that you want to write to top a top researcher in your field and to her or him you want to tell about your interest in working with them how would you write it so go on writing it so actually write something on your pen and paper or on a laptop and write is write it as you were you would write to you know to these people i'm audible at the back also right Does anyone have extra pens, paper? Anyone in need of them? Just do barter system and. You don't need to worry about the specifics. So maybe just write about a broad field. If you don't, to anyone, pick <coughs> Doctor X as a name. And I hope it's not too cheating. The scope there is no scope to cheat. Right? It has to be very personal letter because you're writing about yourself. Writing you can't write it for someone else. it also might be very especially pertinent for the first year mtex because you know, you'd probably write an email to the csc faculty here you know if you want to work with you if you want to either you can go and talk in person or you probably like write an intro mail let's take another minute and then just wrap it up
ठीक है लेट्स लुक एट बिफोर गोइंग टू द गुड एग्जांपल्स वी शुड ऑलवेज लुक एट सम बैड एग्जांपल्स ऑफ थिंग्स नॉट टू डू एंड दिस इज बाय योर्स ट्रूली दिस इज अ यू नो दिस इज अ पैथेटिक एग्जांपल ऑफ हाउ टू राइट एन इंट्रोडक्शन मेल व्हिच आई रोट इन आई थिंक 2011 कैन यू पॉइंट आउट सम easy to point out mistakes like easy to notice mistakes in this uh names always written in the end i think that's 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 fine i think that's so there are far better far bigger issues than just missing the name yeah so i think i did give the context but okay yeah so all all the stuff you're pointing is valid but you're still not getting the to the root of it huge grammatical huge number of grammatical errors spacing after commas again so this is english stuff but otherwise you know it's, it's it looks like a very cribbing kind of an email right you know because of this this i wasn't selected or because of this then work out well so you should never write something like this and i hope that if you've read any of my recent emails i think i write somewhat better than this now so there is a scope for improvement uh, just just for like, all of you should know that so we can always improve someone can go from this bad to you know not so bad this is how a good introductory email can be written so and this is this is borrowed by uh, borrowed from the professor is n you start by addressing dear professor abc xyz in india usually people write dear sir i think that's fine not not a dear sir or ma'am not a big deal but uh it it might always be better and safer to write dear doctor or professor because many times indians uh and i'll be sharing the slides so you don't need to take the pics so many times indians do tend to you know misjudge the gender of the person and and if they mass email and they send dear ma'am or dear sir to a you know to a lady professor you're not going to get any forward with your application so that is something you really need need to be beware of so so now the, uh, let's look at some good points in this introductory email any show of hands like what are some good things you see in this sorry Uh, I think that's fine. So, so, so the first thing you want to do is to quickly tell about yourself. Uh, it's probably you don't want to go into a lot of details. You want you don't want to tell that you know my blood group is B positive and my height is six feet. You don't want to go into all that nitty gritties, but enough to help them make a decision. uh in the previous email i didn't mention all of that that was very naive of me to write then you quickly mention about yourself uh you provide more context to the advisor or to the person you know i am planning to gra- i'm i'm planning to attend graduate school so now the person is you know all more all the more interested in you because professor now knows that you know this is someone who is already coming to my my institution or is planning or this person is planning to attend with the focus on x uh, field you want to show some interest in the professor work uh, also and many times i get emails you know i am a dear professor vatra i am or dear sir i want to work with you i am interested in cloud computing machine learning computer vision embedded system robotics uh, i think all of the possible fields but that doesn't but i don't work in all of them i maybe don't work in either any of them so that's completely useless to me they have not done their background i if so if someone doesn't show enough diligence and sincerity in sincerity to write an initial email i can't trust them to show any sincerity if they were are they going to work with me so i think these are just some soft signals or some signals which become very apparent to the to the uh, person on the other end you show some clarity so this person is showing that you know i took uh, i i had a chance to read your article that uh, it gave me future some future ideas i want to work on this kind of a specific project uh, with some focus so it might not be the exact project topic 
but you know this is i don't this person is not saying that i want to work on uh, in computer science that's completely you know too broad a field to work on this person is also very precise in uh, their in inquiry let's so they are not asking so this can be answered by a simple yes no uh, answer you know i just wanted to inquire whether you are currently accepting graduate students or not so we should always be trying to write emails which reduce the burden on the uh, you know the person to whom we are sending the email if they can reply to your precise inquiries that makes it all the more easier and they're showing willingness and background they've done some background work so they're showing that uh, i'm i'm willing to visit your campus i'm willing to talk to you on phone uh, so we'll see another email uh, towards the latter half of this uh, seminar where someone else did not do all of these things and, and i'm sure that it will really really you know make you feel bad if you don't do these things okay so you get another minute now now uh look at the previous email you wrote did you see did you write all of these points or did you miss any of these a show of hand on you know what's the thing that uh you you, you missed yeah. while writing any while writing this kind of an email and you don't need to worry about you know being judged and just precisely for the matter that you shouldn't be worrying uh to be judged i showed the email which i wrote so anyone or did everyone write a perfect email no i like i don't know my name but i inquire whether you are getting the inquiry from the right so so it's one thing to you know to this looks like a very british written email to me because you know you there's an over emphasis on formalities which which is good in some sense uh now okay so anyone else what is something you missed in your email and you found useful in this yeah right so so what would happen is you know if if atisha doesn't mention his majors two things could happen one thing you know this just gets lost in the thousands of emails i get every day uh second thing could happen is you know i'll have to email back to him okay so i think you have interest in my field but could you come back to me with your cv and your grades so that's two or three additional emails which need to be circulated with each increasing email there is an increasing pro probability that you know the professor goes on some leave they have some conference and your your mail just gets lost up in the pile so it's always better to give enough details so that they don't need to question you again so sometimes you do sometimes you don't so i would still do so i would still just write three lines because attachment is something which needs to be additionally opened and like i think uh, harsh mentioned this very nicely in the talk which he delivered uh, a couple of days back so you have please try and make your resumes like like attach pdfs don't attach doc doc or uh, docx or those formats okay anyone else who had uh, who had made some mistakes and is a human being yeah okay yeah so that's while a minor thing but that i think that's a good observation that you want to have you don't want to muddle up everything into a single paragraph anyone else right right so right so i think that's again an excellent point that now you get now you get to see one good structure i'm not saying that this is the only possible structure there can be many good structures this is one possible way of writing this kind of an email so the top email collaborator is my advisor shown in the big uh, blue dot uh, i was also mentioning to him in uh, about 5 years and one month back from now that you know i was just acknowledging the fact that uh, so we had discussed about so we had about 1000 plus emails with only my advisor and me 
this was about a year and a half into my PhD. So year and a half is what um, about 550 odd days, right? And about a thousand emails, more than an email a day. So writing to your advisor, communicating with them becomes extremely important in your research as well as your general engineering career. So this is the second exercise. You've been working on some project. So I don't care about what project you're working on. If you're not working on a project, think of some project. Maybe just think about the course project. And you want to discuss uh, some details. You want to tell them about the latest results or latest findings. So you just write an email to your advisor telling her or him about your latest results. And let's do this in the next three or four minutes. <coughs> Let's try to write on our own. Let's <coughs> Okay, so as usual, as the practice has been thus far, I'll show you a really bad written uh, results email by written by any guesses. Yeah. But you should keep a look on the timeline. So this is November 27, uh, 2011.
so tell me some things you see which are particularly annoying completely useless really bad i so i didn't know how to write i at that point of time what else spaces okay too lengthy too lengthy i'm not sure about that no paragraph okay <coughs> sorry extra information like yeah okay anything else sorry text is not justified okay sorry so dear sir i think that's that, that's a very minor thing so i'll bring about some more the bigger issues one is spelling and grammar so spelling and grammar check is a must if you're writing any kind of emails or any kind of communication <laughs> i think it, it this should be you know shouldn't before pressing send there should be some button or there should be some check that you do for every single communication so irrespective of whether you just writing it for a you know course project or you just even uh, writing casually to your friend because this becomes a part of you and given that you're repeating this habit 10000 times over you know uh, in one year or so so you don't want to form bad habits you form good habits by practicing every single time you do a spelling and grammar check now if if over time you'll become uh, proficient enough that you know you don't need as such a you know grammarly kind of a tool or you don't have to type it in ms word look at grammar and spelling mistakes and then copy paste it to uh, to your email client eventually that will happen the second thing is that beyond the fact that this looks lengthy the scope is going beyond a single uh, topic and so so the first topic i'm mentioning that you know i've been putting the updates regarding some emulator which i had to build second is that i'm trying to fix a meeting with him in the same email that i'm sending him results reporting some problems third is an idea i had so i wanted him to you know can we host some interns from uh, neighboring colleges fourth is some paper which i had read so four distinct parts they should have never gone into the same email now if my advisor has to respond which of these does he respond to you know how does he even respond i think partly because he was a very good person he you know he didn't chastise me he didn't say anything at this point of time and he gradually helped me develop as a better person as a better writer i think i can stand here in front of you otherwise i think this is really naive email uh this is something which i had uh, i'd written july 19th 2017 so this is uh, last year this is probably a much better example of how to write a results email so firstly the informate the subject is fairly informative so this means incorporating static home factors now if the the advisors have to search for this particular email it's far easier the previous email i think i thought even mentioned but i think it didn't even have a subject so never write that so never write that kind of an email so it has a good uh, it has a good precise and informative subject uh the next important thing you always want to do is to provide some context or link to the previous discussion so imagine that you met your advisor on wednesday now you're writing the email on friday or saturday the advisor would probably have forgotten about your project because for you it's the only project you're working on for the advisor it's one of the 10 things they're working on so they don't maybe remember the context of the email until unless you explicitly specifying uh, specifying it at the top of your email that you know uh, we previously discussed to one to do one particular thing our current understanding is this or you told me to do this then you mention the aim or the hypothesis of of the experiment or of the results that you're sending so you want to clarify what what is the aim of the entire thing or what is your thought process you if it's an experimental project you mention the or experimental kind of research you mention the experimental setting like you mention that i've mentioned the four different parameters 
So I've had emails, I've written emails where they would again come back to me. If I don't mention the experimental setting, they come back to me and ask, hey, uh, they'll ask, uh, what is the value of this parameter? What is the value of the next parameter? So again, it's not use of, it's not a good use of their time and my time if there has to be repeated communication on such trivial matters. So for theory people, the set of parameters could be, you know, the set of constraints that they have or some subset of the problem they're trying to solve. Uh, then I'm providing the results, which you should always do when you're writing a results email. But many of us would stop at results. I think that's, that's, that's not a good way to do things. So if you just stop at results, basically you're advising, uh, you're requesting your advisor to do, to find the takeaway, to conclude the work for you. So just putting a graph doesn't make anything. So you have to tell what you saw in the graph. How does that link to the aim of the experiment or aim of the study? Uh, what, do you, what is your takeaway? Now this is important because your takeaway might not be the best takeaway you can have from the plots. Maybe there's something deeper to it, but at least you need to put your foot forward. You need to start thinking. I think many of us, including me initially during my PhD days, were very lazy. We don't want to think. We can do the coding part, we can get the graphs, and then we say, okay, let's the advisor think about the next steps or what do we infer from these graphs. And once you've done the conclusions, once you've thought about the takeaways and conclusions, you, you should naturally be thinking about the next steps. So one way is that, you know, you send this email, the advisor comes back to, comes back to you with, uh, you know, these should be the next possible steps. But don't you think it would make a better impression if you yourself propose some next steps? Now, it's very possible that these next steps could be completely bogus. They could be completely useless, but at least you're thinking. So that thought process, that, that amount of sincerity, when it starts getting into your emails, it can start getting, so it starts getting into your blood also. Then. Uh, okay, so does anyone want to discuss the emails that they've written and you know point out some mistakes that they made or some lessons they've learned from, from this? from the better emails results context okay so so how how were you writing the email earlier directly writing out the results so maybe you're working on sorry permutations so let's say if he's working on permutations and he'll say that i read this paper i uh, found a new theory i proposed you know i i wrote some solution it works in order n cube, something like that. But if he's not exactly tying it up to the previous meeting, so there is a disconnect. So again, there is some cognitive load which the advisor has to additionally put. Anyone else who learnt anything from the, this example? So results you should all, sorry? Okay, so one, one at a time. So screenshot with the concluding. So you mean the result with the concluding. So it may or may not be a screenshot. You cannot as well as you know attach a PDF. Anyone else? What have we learned from this exercise? Yeah. Sorry? So you want to have a meeting. So that's a different kind of an email. So, so this is only if you have, you have already met the person, you're trying to, you know, submit some results. You're trying to share some results, get the advisor's feedback. So, Sorry, couldn't, couldn't get you. Okay, so that's, so he's saying that he was, before he communicated his, his results, he was trying to have a meeting. So uh, why would you want to do that? So you would probably want to make the other person's time appear valuable. And that will be valuable if you've done some work, you have some precise inquiries. That precise inquiries will come if you've done what you discussed previously. You have thought it through. You Maybe what you've done is not correct. But at least you followed the procedure. You've, you've been more scientific. You've, you've been rigorous in your... Uh, in your in your work so after that it's fairly like it's up to them whether they have slot for meeting or not or whether you're meeting regularly or not okay last one 
What have you learned from this exercise? <laughs> <coughs> Sorry, could you could you say a little louder? Okay. Right. So so he's saying that if your result is not complete, what do you do? So you could. So what? I, I don't think there's a universal solution to this. What I might do is to be accountable to my advisor. I would say that we discuss all of this thing. Uh, I've done x percent thus far and the remaining y percent will take some time after which I'll give you the results. I'll do something like that. I'll maybe postpone the meeting or I'll based on the x percent, I'll see if there can be some initial remarks that we can make. And this happens very often. So, you know, sometimes you write some buggy code which takes time to, you know, just five minutes before the meeting you realize, oh God, I made a mistake in my code. And of the results I've, I have, uh, I have this far above this. So you make it clear. And human mistakes do happen. So, so as a matter of principle, you should be trying this, but maybe not all of the time should be able to do that. Okay, so this is the final exercise in this session. Now you want to write an email to a researcher whose project or tool you want to use, and you have some questions. Uh, so let's say, give me some examples of projects, tools you want to use. Uh, maybe someone wants to use um, sequence to sequence. Anyone wants to use sequence to sequence? Sequence to sequence models. Any machine learning wannabes? Okay, one at least one wants to use sequence to sequence. Let's say it's available on GitHub or on the researcher's web page. They have made it available as a, a zip file or some of the files. Okay, let's look at some other project you want, or maybe you want some clarification. Theory people want some clarification from a researcher regarding some lemma. So, so tell me some other projects you want to use from the internet and you want to seek some help. After that, we'll go to this exercise. Bhastik. Acha, Bhastik. Okay, so you know he wants to use uh, this tool for micro architectural attacks, and you know maybe the documentation at this point of time is not good enough, or he has some queries regarding it. If the documentation is good enough, you know he should be anyway putting the effort to read it and then come up with specific questions. But okay, so that's one tool. There are sequence to sequence models. Anyone else has any example of tools projects? or theory researchers you want to talk to regarding some queries. Is the question clear to everyone? Okay, so maybe just write this email assuming that I'm assuming that you don't know the project you want to seek help on. So it's you've you're seeking help on project X, which exists on someone's web page or on GitHub. So it's not all of us have an idea about this, so we'll keep this short. So let's take only one minute and try and write this. The kind of questions could be, let's say I was showing that example of that email uh, software, right, which MIT has developed. So that was called Immersion. So let's say you're running, uh, you're running Solaris operating system for some reason. So you want to check with them whether this will, like how, if, if you can provide some easy to use compilation instructions for Solaris. Let's look at a bad example of doing this. So this is someone who wrote to me a while back. 
up like i feel really bad in sharing someone else's uh, email or uh, sharing what they've written but uh, you know i'm showing this only as an example so no personal hatred towards this person i don't even know this person actually to be honest just showing this as an example to make uh, all of us better writers so this person has written that i'm an assistant i am assistant professor of something something of i am pursuing some degree probably under some person uh nd what is nd and right nd now i want to discuss with you on intrusive load monitoring my guide told me to meet you and have a discussion on this paper which paper sir kindly give me time on this sunday in reply to delhi because i will be free on that day only and i think you too i don't know how anyone can you be be an oracle and think about others person so i i don't i have not mentioned any calendar at that point and i need to because this person needs to do something that is why and they need to, they have some deadlines i'm eagerly waiting for a response thanking you so what all are the mistakes that you don't want to do based on this uh okay so i'll i'll go in the order in which i've written so with the subject required <coughs> regarding required meet for project which project so i'm i'm involved in 10 projects which one if i look at the subject on my phone i don't i find it to be very hazily written on no subject i might as well just delete it i won't do it but you know maybe sometime in the future where i'll get 10000 emails at all i'll probably delete of uh, really unprofessional language and so this is like you're seeking someone's time why would you you know feel so entitled to seek someone's time you're seeking someone's help never do this so uh okay so i replied to this person i replied that you know can you please tell me what exactly you wish to discuss because that wasn't clear to me in the previous email i and i told that i very clearly told that i'm not i'm unavailable on weekends we can probably discuss on phone so i wouldn't probably dis- i wouldn't discuss on phone if i don't see enough seriousness So okay the project is regarding some smart building energy management for that they need to monitor load of a room i have seen your paper regarding load monitoring and disaggregation of load to different device as available so that's a very difficult sentence for me to parse but how can b measure should be v i think how can we measure actual power drawn by devices or what is python no idea for that so if if you can't so so while while this seems very funny like very hilarious but So it's sad it's also a sad state of things that you know we we not of course of, of course we cannot train everyone for everything but at least this amount of rigor and training we i think we should expect institutions to to some extent to hand us over that you know if we if we can't understand some things we can google search for them before writing an email to so is there any programming included no problem we can talk on phone but why should i talk on phone you want to talk i don't want to talk but we have a group who is working on this project group who a group which is the correct usage which right group which is working on this project so it is better if we all meet and discuss other issues also why should i meet when you will free so <laughs> mobile number is this and and then so asking me to contact them i'm never going to do that why should i contact you you seek my help so i i think i replied one or once or twice more but beyond that i gave up so i tried to so i was i wasn't playing with this person i didn't want to mock them i genuinely wanted to help them but if they're not willing to help themselves like this limited amount of help i can give uh, but there, this is someone who wrote to me an email so i, I really really like the email i think this is one of the one of the more perfect emails i've received regarding some help so they are required so if you look at the subject it's fairly perfect like looking at the subject i know very clear you know what i need to do how to download full data set to run demo of this project for bilsis everything is fairly clear at this point of time uh it's a very precise query so they have told that they have installed this project they are trying to run this uh they have read the guidelines so they have at least put in some effort they've read the read me the full data set can be downloaded from this data set the credentials are omitted but there is no information in the so 
in the readme so that's an error on my part that i've not provided the uh, you know the information regarding where exactly the data set can be downloaded and the tone is very polite it's very well written you can look at different uh you know different programs sorry sorry different paragraphs so it's an email like this is very likely to get a response from me and so no matter how you know technically correct the other person could have been but if it's written in this way i'm much more likely as a human being to respond to to them so anything you learned from this exercise that you were making as like any mistake you were making and you learned it from this exercise i hope that there's a not not a lot to learn from this uh, exercise i hope you know all of us were doing stuff good but did anyone learn anything new not much i think this is fairly subjective so this was so these kinds of emails i think are more so i wanted to touch more on the topics of what to avoid what to write is you know probably more subjective and based on you know some people would like if you even provide all the stack trace and everything in the first email itself but just so i think more than the implementation it's it's the also the thought process that we need to have you know that i'm asking for someone else's time they might be busy i want to write it in a way that you know they can help me the quickest possible way so that's the thought process if we really take that to you know heart i think we'll we'll generally write things better uh i don't think we want to rewrite this so the key takeaways are that everyone is busy bad emails don't get replies especially if you're applying for admissions or uh, if you if you not if not read the faqs like some advisors or some professors would typically have some you know read this before writing an email to me and they still keep on getting sir i am this person from xyz college i have done engineering and so they say that you know i don't care about that so our admissions only happen through a central committee apply there so they have just that they have this scant response which they provide to everyone uh some tips some general tips are to have a meaningful and precise subject so that the other person just looks at the subject and can solve it uh, and like can think more on it set the scene by providing the context provide a tldr version too long didn't read version uh, be polite in your tone proofread your emails uh, do your homework don't write something you know just absurdly because you are some idiot be precise limit the scope so none of this if you notice is actually you know talking about how to do research none of it this is talking about the approach none of this so this is something which with practice will improve some of the you know some percentage of the quality of your work so and this is something not very difficult to do i think it's more a question of practice and habit and being more aware okay so with this we should be now moving on to the next topic you guys want to have a 3 4 minute break for the next topic or should i just go uh into the next topic okay so the next topic is uh is more to do with writing better papers this is about writing better research abstracts and any of us have written a paper here written full fledged paper here so so i think you can relate very well with the phd comic being shown here that you know, we think it's a very trivial process but it's actually not, not that trivial it becomes easier with practice we'll look at uh, how paper is structured and this is one of the paper i wrote so we usually have a title does everyone know that we have the authors we have the abstract which is a really small summary of the entire project of the entire paper does everyone know that a paper has an abstract anyone here who has not seen a paper research paper all oh, right everyone has seen a research paper then there are different sections maybe in this order maybe in some other order i usually write in this order i introduce the work i provide the related work i provide my approach and then how to evaluate my approach i provide the limitations and future work and i then conclude so not all of this what i'm going to discuss in this paper and this talk 
might be directly applicable to you know more mathematical side of computer science but uh, but but take it with a grain of salt and see how you could apply in even theoretical sciences <coughs> this is definitely very applicable in empirical computer sciences and then you have the references so uh, let's spend 2 minutes and read this paper abstract read this carefully and see if you like and then we look at you know different different facets of this abstract Everyone read the abstract. So generally, we can. This is a good way to write an abstract. So I think this is one of the best abstracts I have generally seen. This is written by my postdoc mentor. So a good structure is to provide the context. Some sometimes the context can be very implicit. So if this is written in a community where many of the researchers already know that you know. all us homes have good have large amount of water heater and water heaters basically geysers so geysers uh, take up a lot of water and they take up a lot of electricity so if, the, if that context is clear you may or may not want to specify it but in some cases it's always good to even if the context is implicit just to make it more explicit uh, you then want to write about the motivation of the work or the motivation of the project so in this case the motivation is that the average home is flushing thousands of gallons which is a huge amount of water down the drain while standing in the fixture and waiting for hot water so does everyone understands what what is happening so in in an attempt to optimize for comfort what is happening is you know people open the tap and since hot water is not ready at that point of time all that water just goes down the drain because you know they don't want to uh, put their hands in cold water so that's the problem they're trying to address they come they mention some related work so whenever you writing some scientific work until unless you are very sure that what you doing is has no 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 related work you mention some related work like in this case they mention that some households use a pump for hot water circulation to ensure that the hot water is always immediately available but these systems can occur, incur more than 1000 dollar per year in energy cost so you mentioned that so you motivated the problem that thousands of liters of gallons of water wasted you mentioned that there exists some solution to this problem we are not the first one but there is a problem so one of the key words in a good written abstract is there exists something but there is some problem with the previous approach you mention your approach that you know we are using some intuition that uh, just in time hwr can reduce the energy footprint also <coughs> evaluation is fairly important you know so i can be the next newton or einstein and can propose a very good theory but if it's not evaluated well enough you know the paper will get rejected so they provide a good evaluation strategy so they say that we analyze hot water usage patterns from five homes for 7 to 10 days each Uh, there are the results that are circulo can reduce the energy needed for hwr by 30% while still providing households with hot water over 90% of the time and then there is the conclusion so conclusion sometimes people leave it as an implicit conclusion so because it's a important problem so they said that you know I'm, and what they providing is a very good solution it solves it reduces usage of energy by 30% 90% of the homes so it can be scalable cost effective solution that's the uh, underlying conclusion so if we look at these seven <coughs> points a good abstract has mentions the context in which the research is has to be done gives a good motivation it mentions the prior art which is the related work but it mentions the word but uh you discuss about the approach you evaluate it you mention how you've done the evaluation you don't evaluate it in the abstract you mention the results 
And then what's the key takeaway or the conclusion from the results? Why are these results important? And so now we'll discuss a few common pitfalls which papers have. So what we'll do in the next five to 10 minutes is just look at this abstract and shoot this paper down. If, if we find something in, you know, that is not good. So we'd be using the following color coding. So green means good and red means bad. So let's say that the context was that all US homes have water heaters. If all US homes have water heaters, is this an important problem to work on? Yes or no? Yes. Let's say if 2% US homes have water heaters, is this an important problem to work on? Maybe it is for these 2% homes, but on a global, you know, large scale of things, not a very important problem. So this shortcoming is often called, you know, not enough piece of the pie because of the piece of the pie. So if you assume you have a pie, you're choosing a very small piece and you're focusing on that. In many of the cases, this is not very useful. Uh, let's look at the motivation. If an average home is flushing thousands of gallons of water down the drain, it's an important problem. What if you were wasting tens of gallons per home? Maybe it's not a, enough, enough of a problem to work upon. So what usually happens is just by reading the abstract, I get to know the flavor of the work. I get to understand, you know, whether this is an important enough problem or not. If it's not important enough, you know, I might have to actually read the entire paper, but I formed a very big bias in my mind that this pro problem is not important enough to be, you know, to access this paper. So very likely that the paper will get rejected. Uh, what if the prior art is good enough? So in this case, it's said that the prior art uses some technology. Let's not bother about the technology, but the technology cost more than thousand dollar per year in cost. Let's say if prior art use some technology Y, where the cost was $5 per year energy cost. So what I'm now trying to propose is, can I save that $5 per household? Why should I care? So basically we should be trying to, you know, uh, not work on these problems if the, so this is the type of problem where the prior art is already very good. So let's say you're looking at some, you know, statistical or machine learning problem and the prior art has achieved 99.9999999% accuracy. Why bother working on that problem? Like un until and unless that 10 raised to power minus six would also make a difference. In this case, $5 saving would, uh, doesn't make a difference. So assume that, you know, someone comes up with this technology, which has to be installed in your home, which is going to be probably disruptive. And they say, at the end of the thing, we'll save you $5, who cares? What if we're using a weak baseline? So let's say that prior art was using some HWR, which is probably the state of the art. So then if this is a good paper, a good abstract. But if, but if in the abstract we write that, you know, some households use a 1940s technology and waste thousand USD. So the prior art is not good. So we effectively, what we're trying to do is to sell our approach by comparing it against a very weak approach that's not going to work. So again, the evaluation is weak and I can see that from the abstract itself. I don't need to read the entire paper. Uh, in terms of evaluation, let's, so let's say that they, so here they mentioned that they've uh, analyzed patterns from five homes over a period of seven to 10 days. If instead we were using patterns from two different homes over a period of two days, which evaluation will, uh, will you be more confident in? First one, right? Uh, in terms of results, I think this is one of the most important uh, thing which we often miss in papers. So the metrics may or may not tie to the motivation. So in this case, if you remember the motivation, so it was, you know, we, uh, many of them are wasting thousands of gallons of water. So can we save that? So eventually the metric should be uh, somewhat related to saving the amount of water. It should not be related to, you know, let's say, my system could predict water need with 95% accuracy or uh, provide some, some other thing. So what's important here to look at is, can you tie back your results to the original motivation? 
they can be incomplete metrics. So in this case, a good example is I'm mentioning that the energy uh, can be reduced by 30%, but still by providing households with hot water over 90% of the time. Compare this to, you know, I can reduce the energy by 30%. This is not giving me the complete picture. So, you know, it could very well be the case that I am providing them hot water only 10% of the time. So I might as well come up with an approach, you know, I can save the energy required by HWR by 100%. But uh, what is the shortcoming there? I don't use the HWR at all. Basically, if I don't use the, you know, hot water recirculation, I'm saving all that energy on that, but I'm never giving them hot water. So I'm giving them hot water 0% of the time. So you need to satisfy both the constraints. You need to have complete set of metrics. Is this clear to everyone? Okay, so let's spend the next four minutes in creating a smart coffee machine. So you have to write these seven points for a smart coffee machine. I don't care about the approach. So don't, maybe don't even bother writing out the, uh, about the approach. So everyone is trying to make things smart, right? Smart home, smart planet, smart grid, smart student or whatever, smart classrooms. So we're going to write, uh, make a smart coffee machine. So last two minutes. Okay, so here's what I thought. Uh, we'll discuss some of your solutions also. So the context is that X percent of homes in the US have coffee machines. Uh, motivation is that, you know, you'll require, you want to make something smarter because of some problem. The problem is that why work hours are lost annually due to late coffee. So in this case, uh, the implicit assumption is that coffee is 
proportional to productivity may or may not be true but this is just a trivial example we are taking. Prior art is that there exist some coffee makers, they have timers but they have a problem. We, let's say we have an approach which requires some sensors, some learning, some optimization, maybe they put some sensors in your home, they put some sensors, they, they look at your smartwatch, they find some schedules, they look at your accelerometer data to find out when you wake up, anything of that sort, but that's not a uh, you know, focus today. Evaluation, how do you evaluate whether a smart coffee maker works or not? So you'll have 100 homes with both types. So you want homes where you install a smart coffee maker, you have you want to have homes where coffee maker smart coffee maker is not installed, or they're using some uh, previous uh, some some previous uh, prior art, and then your result would some be something like this: that's <coughs> homes with smart coffee maker have z percent high productivity. So does this example look fine to all of you? And then your know, implicit conclusion is that it's an important problem, and companies should start. Subsidizing smart coffee makers or things like that. Okay, so any other answers to you know any other any other way you would have written <coughs> or yeah. So uh, in most of the offices they have training machines in order to over and they have to Okay. Okay. So, so the problem uh, or the approach that he is presenting is that so the context is that all of the offices have coffee machine, coffee machines, and all of them require a lot of manual operation where you go, you freshly brew your coffee based on the kind of coffee you wish to make. That takes about three minutes. And on average, three minutes wasted per day for X amount of employees leads to uh, X dollars wasted for the company, which leads to you know X percentage of the GDP being lost. So that's the whole thing which are tying up. Of course, you need to be very clear at, or you need to be sure that the piece of the pie is not too small. That whether three minutes is good enough or not, whether it's a you know big number or not. not yeah. So I I don't know those numbers. I'm just saying that this is something you need to. <coughs> be clear about when you're working on the problem. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, anyone else had any other thoughts on what their smart coffee maker would look like or how they evaluate it? Evaluation may uh, like how many, you know, how, how did we write the evaluation? <coughs> how did you write the evaluation? Any, anyone wants to give a shot? It's fine if you don't know, if, if you've writ written something else. Maybe that's also correct. So don't worry about that. And we're all learning here, sir. How would you evaluate? How would how you written? Uh, so, what would you write? Maybe we can be using an input credit when you come to coffee. Okay. So, when uh, after we uh, saw a smart coffee machine, then what we can do is we simply will get from this thing to get the coffee machine. Okay. Okay, so what he's saying is that he's uh, talking about the amount of time saved. So if, he, if you're using the metric time saved, then the motivation should also be about time saving. So that's something clear. You don't have to then you know, tie it up to like in his case, uh, the GDP. So that's very clear. You need to ensure that. And in terms of evaluation, how, in terms of evaluation, how do you do that? So you just simply measure how much time you are standing in the corner. Okay. 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 So that's fair enough. So uh, in their system, they'll basically have for each user which who comes uh, before coming to before using the system, they look at the start time and end time. They'll historically log it, and then they look at you know how each users. Uh, usage decreased over time. Is that true? But one of the caveats is that, you know, I'm a lazy person and, you know, I just like to stand at the coffee machine. So, will you do it on a per person basis? Will you look at the relative reduction per person or as a group? 
So in general for such studies it's always good to do as in terms of groups we have two different groups to one of them you so initially both of them are let's say not using any technology they're just using the simple ones uh, and let's say there is no prior art so one group keeps on using the you know the simple technology the other group they were previously using one technology and after that they're using the new technology so then you look at the delta between the two so the, the reason this approach is required is let's say that you know uh, there is a there is an office deadline so so in in june everyone was using the same technology 100 people of group a were using technology uh, the old technology 100 people group b they were still using the old technology in june this was normal office working but in august there is a you know there is a deadline everyone is really busy so the group 1 people they start making coffee quicker group 2 will also do that because they have deadline now you cannot just by looking at you know if you don't have two groups and you say that that the coffee reduction reduced whether it's is it due to the fact that is it due to the fact that you know there is a general change in the parameter space so the parameter change in the sense that you know now everyone has a deadline so now you look at the relative difference so you look at the reduction in time of group B and you subtract uh, the reduction in time of group A. So basically now you have removed the effect of you know changes in external factors which affect both the groups. Okay so the last question in this uh, so that's generally what you do in uh, an empirical uh, so you generally have a control group uh, there are other kinds of research so there is qualitative research for which the evaluation strategy would be you know, slightly different in terms of theoretical research again the evaluation is whether you have proved or not or uh, whether you've disproved or not and generally in empirical research this is how you do it so you'll have a or you know Look at that. Uh, look at this from a machine learning perspective. Let's say you're approach, you're giving a new approach. So you'll have a trained set. You'll have a test set. You'll be a, uh, you'll be reporting the accuracy or some metrics <laughs> on the test set. You know, you know, you have some kind of cross validation. So that's the general uh, kind of pipeline you follow there. Sorry. So evaluation. So evaluation metric is a small part of the evaluation. <laughs> evaluation is the entire strategy that you take. So evaluation, in general when I write evaluation, so I write the following section. So I write the baselines, so I mention about them. I just don't mention about them, I mention some of the shortcomings. I mention the evaluation metric I'm using. I mention the experimental methodology. So for example, the baselines have three parameters. <laughs> So I'll say that, you know, I looked at the best parameters or I swept across all of these parameters. My algorithm has these four parameters. So in terms of methodology, I looked at, I swept across all of these four parameters. Uh, for comparison, I looked at this particular metric. So you want to ensure that there is a fair comparison. So you provide all the details of how you ensured. Sorry? No, 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 this doesn't go in the abstract. So in the evaluation, in the abstract, you just mentioned that, you know, we... So in your case, let's say you're working on some uh, micro architecture. So we compared our approach against two state of the art micro architecture simulators and we found that our simulator is able to find cash misses, uh, cash miss with 5% more chance, something like that. Uh, so result is what you've obtained. Evaluation is how you obtain that. So evaluation is uh, we compared our work with three baseline algorithms. Uh, the result is our approach performs 10% better, something like that. So they're tied up in one flow, uh, but, but I get what you're saying. So I would prefer to keep them as two different lines because I would want them to be decoupled. So the next exercise is for, you know, let's take three, four minutes. Let's think about some cool research you want to do. And let's write a abstract and then again we'll quickly discuss so think of any crazy idea you want to do you know you want to make a superconductor material you want to 
make a rocket which which can land back without getting destroyed anything you want to you know break the velocity of light anything like that. but i would prefer if you write something more realistic to the csc stuff that you're doing I've, I've personally found this a very good exercise that you know before you write a paper or before you you know dream about making you know big difference in the world just write an abstract so you will get down to the earth and you'll realize that you know what are the shortcomings what's been done before why why is it practical so there are very some some very cool strategies or very some very cool approaches you have or very cool problems to work on but there's no way you can evaluate them evaluation evaluation uh, might take 10 years do you want to work on that But this time it won't be voluntary, so everyone has to. I'll, I'll ask people to now tell what they've written. Let's take just two more minutes and uh, give two seconds. <coughs>
Okay, so I'm going to pick people now. Ayush, right? No. Shreyas. Shreyas. This just also mention the context motivation each of the points. So like this is the context like physical limitations, physical limitations versus improvements have improved in technology scaling. Right. Right. Yeah, so so sometimes you can have the context and motivation uh, fairly coupled, that's fine. Okay, so just mention something that there is some prior art, but it has some limitations. Okay, so so the prior art is basically that there exist. CPU optimizers, let's call it that term, but they work only ahead of time. They cannot work in real time. And because of this ahead of time requirement, there, there is a loss of 30% efficiency, for instance. And that's what he is trying to recover at that particular efficiency. Uh, you have some approach which, so there is some approach which, use, uh, which uses quantum physics and you know, state of uh, some some complex technology that he's developed. So that's the approach. Okay, evaluation. How will you evaluate? Okay, now think, uh, think out aloud. How will you evaluate? Right. So in in a field like uh, you know microprocessor and architecture, there are some very good evaluation strategies already there. So you know there are publicly available benchmarks. So he says that you know we'll use. Uh, Geek bench score, we'll use LM bench or three or four more different benchmark scores. And there are XYZ kind of loads that they've used. And they've used three prior art uh, technologies. And in terms of results, our approach shows that on all of the benchmarks, we are at least better than five, at least better by 5% than the best, than the previous best algorithm. In terms of conclusions, it means that uh, deploying a strategy which uses real-time information can lead to you know, overcoming of some of the limitations of Moore's law. Something on that lines. Okay, so Sovic. Okay, so so. Generally, one caveat is when, when in these kind of problems, it becomes slightly more complicated to evaluate because how do you define new kind of music? Okay. Right. Okay. So the context in this situation can be, you know, the, the, so that's not the context. Previous work is everything is prior art. So the context could be that the number of classical uh, Beethoven like Beethoven level musicians has been on the decline in the past century with numbers dwindling to less than 10 now. So that's the context, for example, very weird one. Uh, in terms of motivation, you said that, uh, you know, there is a rapid increase in technological advances, especially in deep learning, enabled human assistance in, in such tasks. Prior art is, okay, what's the prior art? Prior art already about machine learning, machine learning. For? For music generation, that's for music generation. Yes, some of the different but in good accuracy and Okay, so what he is now proposing is a you know accuracy game now. So it's it's basically can I just beat the previous approach? Can I be more accurate? So one of the things you want to do is to ensure that what you're working on is a, is becoming close to a standard task. So you want to be very clear on that. Uh, so you mentioned that okay, so previously deep learning has been used, but we just don't mention accuracy. We mention that it's not realistic enough to be used. So 
so one of the you know very difficult number to gauge is how accurate do you need to be before it you your approach starts becoming useful is the previous approach you know maybe at 95% it's useful i don't care about getting from 95 to 95.6 so this is something like we need to really question in our research are we doing research for the sake of making impact or this is it just another paper so let's say in this case the current approach is 40% let's say uh, 40% accuracy and human level so human level is something which is uh, you know if we can quantify human level that's excellent human level is say 50% and there is for scoring let's say we can have you know olympic style scoring where we have three judges and they give these scores human level is 60% uh, current technology level is 40% and he needs to get closer to human level because human level is genius required which in his case he is saying that maybe it just happens by birth no one in, no, no genius is uh, you know trained in terms of evaluation uh, you know you look at you give all of these strategies same amount of input uh, including the human now that's some, somewhat subjectively hard to do uh, you look at you define some metrics which tie back to the motivation uh, so evaluation another thing to look at which i probably forgot is to mention the data set what data set have you used is it publicly available what instantiation of the data set are you using are you using a subset right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So last one now. Uh, okay, it's gray. Is that is that a gray or is that a blue? Shirt? Yeah, you. And if you can be slightly louder, please. Loud. Helmet detection system. Okay. So this is a very cool and you know something of practical importance. Okay. Okay. So the context is that uh, ten percent of Indians who are like there are, there is annually twenty thousand accidents in India. That's the big context. Okay. The motivation. So if you let let's say that we use the strategy which I just mentioned, X number of accidents happen in India every year. X number of two wheeler accidents happen in India every year. That's the context. Okay, so the motivation is that out of the seventy percent, out of the you know twenty thousand accidents which happened, thirty percent of them could have resulted in lesser fatalities if the person was wearing a helmet. So, you know, it looks very clean at this point of time. Uh, prior art. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. So another, so sorry to interrupt you at this point of time. Another prior art, which I think in some sense is also the state of the art, is the persuasion methodology or the behavioral change methodology, which let's say the state police has been using. So prior art, prior art is a policeman trying to cut chalan and you know ask people to wear helmets by uh, penalizing them if they are not wearing helmets, but despite but then you mentioned this word. But despite this persuasive, uh, you know, uh, paradigm shift that they're uh, trying to bring by behavioral change, uh, only two percent reduction in uh, fatalities according by by not wearing helmets has occurred. So this is the but word is is a key word here. So then you come with some in some approach. You know, we put up. Uh, so I've, I've actually seen this project in action that the bike doesn't start if you if you're not wearing a helmet. That's a very cool uh, technology, right? And very simple and uh, you know good technology. In terms of evaluation, now are you actually going to reduce, are you actually going to wait for people to die? No, so, um, the, 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 
existing project where it's implemented will implement our project there. Right. And we will analyze it for both the different. So I think in this kind of an experiment, which because it's a human uh, experiment, again dividing into two groups would be useful. To one group, they keep on using their regular uh, roadside helmet. To the other group, you give your helmet. And then over time, so for each of them, you'll have to use some sensor. So that is that is a part of your evaluation strategy. For each of them, we put a sensor in the person, on the person's ear, let's say, which detects whether the person is wearing a helmet or not. And then you look at the change over time by interaction of your technology in terms of results. We are better than XYZ. Uh, then you conclude this. Okay. So does anyone want to break now? We've got two other small sections now coming up. I can go on. Like, so we discuss research, methodology. So this one, uh, scientific method session is a follow-up of the previous one. You see some of the things which I've talked uh, exist there. And this is, again, a very realistic comic on how scientific method is and how it's applied. So the, act, the scientific method is how you should be doing stuff. You observe natural phenomena, you formulate hypothesis, you test the hypothesis. If, if the hypothesis doesn't hold true, you modify it till the time it holds true and then you establish theory. But otherwise, what typically happens in many of the papers is, uh, you know, you make up some theory based on what the funding agency wants you to do. Uh, minimum experiments that suggest theory is true. It's not even proving or showing it's true. Publish a paper and you know modify theory to fit data if the theory doesn't work and then defend theory despite all evidence to contrary. So it should never be happening. It's, it's just mention as a joke. So I, I actually learned a lot about um, you know scientific method from class five students. So while I was in the US uh, interning, so someone, one of my colleagues went to judge a competition for five-year-old children it was not five-year-old fifth grade uh, children so they had some science projects and so there were some set of guidelines for these students and when I went through these guidelines I realized that you know if I am following these I can be a much better researcher so just to put things into context you know we are not doing science well we are, if you just if you just after grades we are generally not doing the scientific method very well so they, they mentioned that there are three different types of projects that the students could make. They could make a model kit, like a volcano erupting. They could have a demonstration or they could have an investigation. And they'd mentioned that, you know, it's the investigative kind of projects which are likely to be most, uh, likely to be awarded. Uh, in terms of investigation, like, so this is the picture which comes in my mind usually. Uh, anyone here who doesn't know this person? Doesn't know. Everyone knows him. Okay, good. Uh, so this was one advice which uh, one of my committee members also gave. So he told me, Nippon, if you want to do good research, be like Sherlock Holmes. Well, uh, I don't think I'll be like him, but I remember that what he said. So the first thing about scientific method, or you know, it's how do you re choose a research topic? I'm sure all of you will, uh, you know. At some point of time, you'll come up to the faculty and say, sir, I want to, or ma'am, I want to work with you. But you're not very sure about the uh, topic. So one of the ways to look at is to be more specific. Instead of saying that I want to work, I want to research in botany. Uh, you know, your science is always driven by some observation or some theory or some, you know, uh, observation related to scientific method is probably what you'd always sign to do. So you go to your garden, you observe that, or you go to the grocery store, you see that some tomatoes are bigger than the others. Some grow faster than the others. So as a naturally inquisitive person, you go and think, you know, why are some tomatoes bigger than the others? Does that question ring? Like, do we get this question? As, I'm, I'm sure as kids, we would have asked our parents, why is this the case? But now we are so bogged down in uh, you know, our academics that such questions don't come to us. But this is exactly what we need to do in order to become better researchers. Just rekindle that kind of uh, uh, questioning spirit. So, so you see that this is a far better uh, kind of question, right? Instead of saying I want to research in botany, I want to now research on why some tomatoes are bigger than the others. It's way more specific. 
the other thing is when you do some research or when you when you carry out the first project uh, you want to pick one variable so in this case let's say you picked up the first question so again the same color terminology holds red is bad green is good so how does size of tomatoes vary with water sunshine soil person who planted it the mali the ground uh, whether it's an iit gandhinagar campus or not whether it's uh, you know sun facing home or not whether it's an independence day or not so you can have thousands of these parameters right not all of them are pertinent and you cannot study all of them so let's start with one particular parameter let's say how does the amount of sunlight affect the size of the tomatoes the other thing you want to do uh, while discussing or while coming up with research topics is to come up with close ended questions so how to best train your dog it's a very subjective very open ended question can we convert this into you know does the type of reward that you give to a dog affect the ability of the dog to be trained close ended right it's either yes or no so these kind of questions are generally better because so how do you evaluate the first one how to best train your dog what is the definition of best you cannot define you cannot relate best to any metric right but the other one it's more subjective it's easier to evaluate so the scientific method is uh, composed of the following steps you start with observation that some tomatoes are bigger than the others uh, you maybe just look up on the internet uh, what kind of a visualization would you want to look at to confirm whether some tomatoes are bigger than the others so i would probably you know search for histogram of uh, tomato sizes or box plot of tomato sizes if it's if it's a very small spread then maybe all tomatoes are of the same size maybe my observation was flawed but i think uh, all of us know that this is not going to be the case this is just confirming your observation uh then you question does the amount of sunlight affect the tomato size now you don't question out of the blue you question because you had some intuition or you knew some elementary science that there is some photosynthesis kind of a process you come up with a hypothesis you come up with this hypothesis that more sunlight uh, leads to more tomato size now this hypothesis may or may not hold true but that's at least something you come up before you even collect data so this is something which i have done wrong many times and we generally do wrong we first collect data and then say let's see what the data tells us never do that so always come up with some intuition or theory backed hypothesis it may or may not hold true but at least you have your thought process clear sorry yeah so then you repeat the hypothesis then you change the hypothesis but uh, you just don't change the hypothesis out of the blue then you again account for various things which have, could have gone wrong in, in the experiment was it a like, flawed experiment was it a flawed <laughs> hypothesis that's again something you need to look at so hypothesis is usually backed by intuition or preliminary observation uh, then you carry out this experiment or test the hypothesis so this is similar to what uh, we were discussing regarding human subject evaluation you have two groups of tomatoes one in sunshine other in shade uh, you conclude by saying that experiments support our hypothesis that plants that receive more sunshine can grow up 10 x percent bigger so if you have noticed that in conclusion we are saying that experiments support our hypothesis we mentioning it's it only as a support as and not as proof because firstly it's an empirical uh, you know uh, empirical evaluation so you can only support your hypothesis you cannot prove it to be correct but more or less a support is usually good enough if the experimental methodology is uh, good enough the other reason is you cannot exhaust the space like you can uh, you cannot look at all possible tomatoes in the world to be very sure so so you were designed an experiment like the following you have two groups of tomatoes both were planted at exactly the same point using the same seed from the same manufacturer uh, on the same day planted by the same person any other variable you want to look at so just to keep them all same you give them the exact same soil comp uh, uh, like composition maybe you just run it through the microscope also to to clarify this to ensure this you give them the exact same amount of water maybe you use a precision clock to give them exact same amount of water you at the same nanosecond maybe you don't want to do that but you know if you're really finicky about it you the only thing you want to vary here is the amount of sunlight in first case you give 
uh, light L1. The second case, let's say you put it in shade or in some different amount of sunlight, L2 is not equal to L1. So the important thing is you've kept everything constant besides the parameter which you want to study. So this brings us to the different types of variables we have. We have the independent variable, which is the variable that we modify to observe the effect. So in the previous case, the independent variable is the amount of sunlight. The dependent variable is the variable on which we want to observe, which is the changed behavior, uh, which we, variable which we wish to observe, which is the tomato size. Okay, so let's not take 10 minutes, let's take three minutes to think of some everyday thing that you see around yourself and fill in the steps of the scientific method, fill in the observation, hypothesis, experiment, conclusions. So pick up something which is now outside of CSE as a problem that you, any observation that you have, maybe from CSE also if you want to. Could be anything. It could be that you know people who come from uh, satellite towns, or people who come from metro cities like Delhi, Bombay, have uh, stunted growth, or they're more intelligent. Anything like that. So all of this is just to put that habit of practicing these things. I know that we are generally lazy and we generally get excited more about the approach, uh, especially if there is some, some, some cool engineering aspect to it and you know, we can create some cool visualizations. But it sometimes helps to put things into context and you know, look at this. Is anyone who doesn't have any idea on, uh, who's not getting any idea? on your, any observation. Human is, is a good example because you see a lot of variation in this. Could be anything like people who see, you know, some kinds of uh, television <laughs> series show more violent behavior or show more, uh, you know, gripping behavior, anything like that. So humans are fairly easy to fit into these domains. last minute Okay, so I'm going to call out again names. Yes, ma'am. And if you can be a little louder so that everyone can get you. <coughs> so, what's your problem? Yeah, so people who eat less spicy. What are the allergies? They live longer? Okay, so the the observation is that people who eat <coughs> are healthy, but healthier can be slightly more subjective to 
it's like so pick up something you know, pick up something easier to quantify you know okay so people who eat less oil and uh, less spicy live longer your hypothesis so this should actually be your <coughs> hypothesis also so this should be act this is actually your uh, hypothesis your observation is that you know you would have seen some x y z number of people who are eating oily and they're living lesser so that leads to forming formulation of an hypothesis okay experiment are you going to kill people who eat oily are you going to like what what would you do to measure this live longer thing? two people okay you have two groups of people one you give oily food and you wait for 70 years to do that Take. So this will take a long time, right? So some of the medical trials actually do take long. So that's why some of the drugs, uh, by drugs I mean general positive drugs, don't take it in the negative sense. They take a lot of time to come into the market, even before, like even though they have been like approved in research labs, their effect have been shown in research labs for years. Because human subject uh, drug response is is a matter of huge concern. The other way, so because we just mentioning it. Uh, sometimes they use proxy methods, so they give it for for some drugs. They see the behavior on mice, right? So you might you might be able to do this, or there are some other ways to look at it. So in terms of you might want to quantify living longer in terms of certain physiological conditions. So the physiological conditions before they were given this kind of a diet versus after the diet. Okay, this is a very good useful example. Um, okay, Abhishek. I can, I can do. People who play certain types of computer games have a positive result. Okay, so uh, people who play certain Dota, Dota, Dota kind of games have a positive response time. Okay, so this is a hypothesis. Your observation is that you know you. His observation might be that he has a good. You know, he has some friends. Some of them are. Uh, you know, they don't play games at all. They're, they're you know, the boring kind. And, so they are actually very slow. So they might get good grades, but the response time is slow. If you ask them something, you say, oh, why? Well, what do you say? So they take some more time. But some of the others who play action games, you know, they're actually really good in other sports. Also. Uh, how do you test this? Like groups who play, or 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 groups who play, So that's that's something to look at and. Uh, Although there will be some outliers, which are which are always fun, like like so that's uh, something to look at. So by outliers, I mean like players like Cristiano Ronaldo. So those who see football, uh, you know, who follow football, only follow football. So like recently, I heard that uh, he had some tests when he went to Juventus. Although he's 33 years physically, they were telling that he's in terms of the physiological test. So he's actually his body is that of a 20 year old. That gives you. Sorry, that's what he said. I don't know the exact thing. So let's uh, look at the final exercise in this uh, set of slides. Let's say you have a movie recommendation problem. So you have a matrix which looks something like the following. You have users uh, as rows. You have different movies as the columns. Uh, you have the ratings for some of them. Let's say this is like Amazon, uh, Amazon Prime Video. Like if you if you're using that, so you give some rating, but you don't see all the movies, so you can't give rating for all of them. Some of the users might have seen only one movie. Some of them might have not have seen any movie. Uh, my battery is also low. So okay, and you have some of the metadata also. Like you have the user for for corresponding to each user have you have the age and the gender. So the question here is, uh, and, you, and I'm giving you a baseline also, like randomly predict the rating between zero and five. That's some, one of the simplest baseline, right? So the task is, can you like give a rating uh, for all of the you know these empty spots? So if I want to recommend some movie to you for, I'll want to estimate what is 
her or his estimated rating. And if it's a high rating, I'll probably tell them to watch this movie. So I'm I'm giving a very big baseline, which is just randomly put a number between zero and five, almost useless baseline, right? So give me some possible hypothesis for this problem. Think for one minute. And for those of like who've looked at this problem before, you should you shouldn't say the answer because this is fairly easy for you then. Does anyone want to help me with setting this up? Anyone with a pen? Okay, so those who have not seen this problem before will need to answer. What are some of the possible hypotheses? <laughs> Sorry, you would? You look at the movie genre. Okay. And, uh, and then? So that's the approach you're telling me. I want the hypothesis. There's a slight difference between the two, but I want you to capture that difference. So, so in, if I were to convert what he's saying into a hypothesis, I would say that you know, movies of the same genre get the same rating. That's one hypothesis. Is that fine? Any other hypothesis? So now, do you get a flavor of what a hypothesis would look like? Movies directed by the same person get the same rating. Now, why is it flawed? Because different people, you know, I don't like movies directed by X director. You might like it. So tell me the hypothesis then. Okay. Okay, so uh, the hypothesis is that if you like a particular director, you you like all of the other movies by her or him. That's one hypothesis. But this won't help us to solve the exact problem because maybe I've not seen any of this director's movie. So can you still recommend me a score or could, can, can you still give me a score for this movie? That's a very good start. I think we can eventually form this into some good rule. Movies of the same category, of the same genre, all of them will get the same rating. It's it's a valid hypothesis. It may or may not work well because there are people who like uh, rom-coms and there are people who like action. And maybe these this set is disjoint. The reputation of the actor. So if uh, okay, so the hypothesis is that the rating of a movie is directly proportional to the sum of the reputation, the average of the reputation of the actors. May work, may not work. Uh, Swadesh had good actors. Poor ratings. Good movie. Sorry? Yeah. Okay, so I'll show you some positive acts. That's a very good response. Give Yeah, so now you're getting to you now you're getting to the crux of it. But this is not a hypothesis. So you're getting so you're telling me the approach. Can you filter down the hypothesis from this? And that side of the class is very quiet, so. So think of it. In terms of, you know, how do you generally go and watch a movie? Uh, okay, so, yeah, person in the blue t-shirt. So, let's say if you want to, yeah, you. If you want to go and watch a movie, how would you go about it? So, why, like, how do you generally watch a movie? One is you see a trailer, okay. Let's say you don't see a trailer. You, you, you don't have access to a trailer. I, I, you're a hostler, right? So let's say you have uh, the next the next three people sitting to you are your friends. You trust them. You know, you go you go everywhere together. You know, you trust the judgment. So you say that whatever movies my friends like, I like. Them. That's a fair enough assumption, right? But the the next 
question which comes which a part of the approach is how do you define you know who are my friends okay any other hypothesis this is one of the more powerful one this is one of the uh, hypothesis which leads to the eventual uh, most commonly used solution the so people of the same age tend to like the same movies that's one hypothesis previous movies right based on that so what's the hypothesis this is the approach you're telling me <coughs> okay so if you like a particular actor movie you will uh, you like all of their movies okay anyone else so somehow you know we had a lot of discussion on scientific stuff but it's the movies which gives us the best response so uh, one of them is uh, people tend to give similar ratings across movies predict ratings by averaging user ratings weak hypothesis does not work at least won't work for me uh, i won't look at certain movies because they are more popular i would you know look at more critical ratings movies tend to get similar ratings predict by averaging movie ratings so you're averaging across columns this is the second hypothesis approach the first hypothesis that approach that you would average across the uh, the rows this is the one which uh, you know we were talking with him which is probably the most used approach similar users have similar rating preferences and you can predict by finding the rating of the most similar user so the question is how do you define similar user you can define a similar user based on ratings that you have already given and you look at some distance function so i had another exercise but i think we are short on time i'll quickly go on to the last bit so if you can just hold on for maybe 5 minutes more and we'll complete the session uh if you want to do this do it at your time i'm happy to look at your response uh cs probably want to solve in your phd masters bachelors whichever uh, write the paper abstract I think this is one part where most of you might be better than me I think uh debugging for scientists and this is again a cartoon showing that you know what debugging could literally mean but so in fact that's how the name bug was given do you all know the story how did the so then computers used to be you know maybe the size of this room so they actually found a moth uh or some other insect i don't know the detail maybe maybe it's a moth because you're saying it uh so because they found the an actual bug they started naming stuff which causes problems in computers running as bugs so again so code is an important part of what we do uh there are bad <coughs> ways of asking questions on stack overflow or bad ways to debug and then there are good ways to do it So again, what we're looking is to increase the productivity or increase the chances of getting response. Again, we do it in a bad way. We do it in a good way. So this is not uh, done by me. So that's the caveat. So you know, this person is saying that I'm trying to trace out a rectangular area on a surface of a sphere. This is the code I have for sphere. and the comment is by one of the most popular users so if, if you look at the python or matplotlib uh, tag you realize as important as of being honest is one of the more popular or one of the persons who answers a lot of questions so so this is something which i was sometimes guilty of doing in my bachelor's days uh, i try to do something sir i try to do something but i don't know how to do it this stupid question right it doesn't help you to get the answer if you've tried something many of the times who people who say that i've tried something i couldn't get the solution i've actually not tried anything or so i've tried something but it, but but there is some problem what is the problem like if i if you don't tell me the details we don't tell me in a methodological way how do i get to it 
So Stack Overflow uh, gives this uh, MCV as a code line for providing uh, questions on Stack Overflow. And this is in general a very helpful exercise if you want to debug your solutions, in, if you want to debug your code, if you want to in general debug your research methodology also. Like always provide a minimal code to find uh, to which still produces the same problem. So basically what you do is you start with a big code, you keep on reusing one function or one variable at a time till the point you get to the crux of the problem. So I don't want, I've seen people give, you know, 10,000, not 10,000 literally, but you know, hundreds of lines of code and stack overflow asking for, you know, asking for help. But why do I care about all of that extra code? Can you just boil down the problem uh, for me? Complete. So it needs to be complete. I don't need to, you know, imagine uh, some of the code that you have not written. Verifiable. So the code you're giving should be, you know, should be able to very quickly verify and test the behavior that you're reporting. So there, there are two different, two kinds of strategies you could use for creating a minimal, uh, minimal set of uh, solution, with minimal question which uh, still has a problem. One is you start from scratch, you add, so it's, uh, you know, you add one line at a time to, to reproduce the behavior you want, but still reproduces the problem. Or you could divide and conquer, you know, you, you remove code at a time and then you look at the problem. So you could either add code, remove code or any other strategy you want. For example, this is not a minimal example. Why is my graph a crazy flickering monster? Why? So the question does not help the like doesn't help anyone to answer them. And someone is taking out their time, their you know sometime important part of the day to answer your question. And and you, you know all of this is not required. So in terms of complete, make sure that all the information which is required to reproduce the bug or the problem is there. So that you can just load it up, you can just run it. Uh, so an incomplete example. Uh, they mentioned, you know, start of the line x equal to df for petal length, uh, y equal to df for petal width. So for those who've, who've worked a lot uh, with Python and these kind of questions, so they'll realize that this is Iris data set. And so they've basically loaded the Iris data set in a data frame, in a Pandas data frame called df. But those have not, I cannot help them. So if, uh, you know, someone has not given me the entire example. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, an example which I wrote, which I think is a complete example. I told how to get the data set, all the required imports, and Altair is a very cool library, so you should all try and use it sometimes. <coughs> very fable that the problem is actually reproduced by the example you're giving, and eliminate any other issues which aren't relevant. So this is an exercise which I thought we should be doing, but in, in interest of time, we'll, uh, you know, we should just look at it at home. So this is again something which we should in general be doing in our, uh, you know, in course of our computer science education and learning. So with this, I'd, uh, you know, end this session and I'm happy to take any questions, any other discussion or any feedback also if you have for this session. This is the only only the second time I'm taking this session. So I took this session for IIIT Delhi PhD folks last year.